Square Ball Podcast. Welcome to the show, brought to you in association with Astonish, who are sponsoring this one. Michael, I'm looking at you for uh, guidance on where we go with this next. Uh, where do you want to go? The shower? What, do, you want, do you want to wash yourself or do you want to wash the shower? I want to wash. You can my, do either. I want to wash myself, then the shower, and then the kitchen. Well, I'd use shower gel. Yeah. First and foremost, then probably like the shower spray. Yeah. Shine stuff. But I've got a bit of a mold and a mildew problem somewhere around in the shower area. On you, on you, I'm pointing down, pointing at the sealant. Get it sprayed on. There and you go. And there you go. When I'm cleaning the kitchen afterwards, there's the grease lifter. There you go. That's super, isn't it? Um, a Leeds company, astonish. It's good, isn't it? We like that. That makes them even better. Um, ethical household and personal care cleaning products made in Yorkshire. Um, and as I mentioned before, the UK's number one mold and mildew blaster. Number one when it mattered. Exactly. The deep <laughs> the deep cleaning and safe to touch oven and grill cleaning paste as well is a good one. I've used that. I have genuinely used that on my oven as well. Um, no harsh chemicals, no corrosives, and officially certified cruelty free and vegan. Astonish.co.uk for details. Thanks to Astonish for their support on the Friday version of the show with Phil Hay, who is here. From the athletic, we don't do this much research for the show, do we? Not really. You're doing to astonish. Does Michael have to keep this going all season, every every Thursday, Friday, banterific for two or three minutes? I mean, I do actually use quite a lot of this stuff, so it's, it's well, comes quite, it comes quite comes quite easily. Surprise, yeah. <laughs> well, we are here for the back end of the week show, Phil. Um, we're going to reintroduce a feature that we had on the Phil Hay show when we were hosted over on the Athletic, which is Phil's one to watch as we head in towards Millwall. So, should we get into um, the weeds a bit with Millwall? Back after the uh, the international break, we had a bit of fun over the international break. Thought we'd mix it up a little bit. We interviewed you about being a small drunken child in Scotland. Did anyone enjoy it? Uh, no, 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 didn't think it no, no, that's your fault rather than mine. Yeah, no, there, were, no. there were complaints that you still didn't put a picture of your bird on. Yeah, as, I as saw the that. Famous tweet I saw that. Yes, requested. Next, next time, that has to be one of the all-time great tweets. That one, by the way. Um, well, we were talking about, about the um, Ross McCormack triangle head tweet, and it was from a totally different era when. Um, Twitter was in its infancy and finding itself. Yeah, yes. happy days. Um, yeah, so it is international break. We had a chat about um, just you being a, a youngster and now you got into journalism, which was uh, interesting if you're into that sort of thing. If you're not, just skip past it. But it's the previous episode in your, um, in your feed, in your timeline. Back to the football this weekend and back to Millwall. And uh, this, feel, this feels very... You're in the championship now, but everybody, you're, I, going, you're I, going back to the den. It's mid-September. This is what you do. This is what normally when you go to the den and you lose. Leeds, Leeds in the championship as well. These have probably been the, the two quietest weeks Leeds have had in about 50 years. Um, so what better way to end it than going to South Bermondsey for, I think, for what is one of the few really, really spiky games in the championship. It, it, it's not a league that's packed with masses of rivalry. I mean, you've got Norwich and Ipswich. You've, you've got little bits and pieces like that, but... This is the one that always seems to have most around it. Um, and I don't think it's a rivalry, though, Phil, is it? It's more, it's more just no, it's a real I'd, spikiness. Yeah, um, it's mutual antipathy, I think, isn't it, more than, more than anything. I think because Leeds got lodged in the EFL for so long after they got relegated and because they and Millwall shared divisions for such a long time, League won as well, and there was obviously that period where both clubs were going for promotion, so they were, they were in each other's you know, view for a long, long time um, in each other's faces for, for a long, long time. And it has kind of, I mean, there's, there's, there are aspects of this fixture which are not great. And, you know, the, the chanting in particular seems to be where, where the problem lies with it. But deep down, I do like going to Millwall for this game. I, I went down last season because I interviewed Charlie Cresswell. Didn't um, you once go in there in hiding? No. No, I think the story you're thinking of is... is that when you pretended um, you were from a, one of the nationals yeah, rather than the YUP? Yeah, I was from the Daily Mail. Yeah, yeah. so you, well, you um, were technically and, in hiding. Well, yeah, no, of sorts. Um, it was one of the few times Leeds had won down there, which I think you were talking about this on Tuesday, Wednesday, when we recorded last, which was the um, Andrew Hughes robotics mm. celebration. Um, I think only twice I've seen Leeds win at the Den. I might be, might be wrong, I need to, to go back through that, but very, very infrequently. So on that occasion, there was somebody to the left of the press box, which is... Um, barried off from the, the home stand, but it's still fairly close, if you know what I mean. Um, it's not like Ninian Park, where you did have people sitting in front of you who did want to fill you in constantly. Um, but yeah, somebody started saying, you know, where are you from? Where are you from? And I, in a Scottish accent, said, I'm from the Daily Mail. Oh, um, I'm from <laughs> to, the Daily Record! To which, um, <laughs> went with the most, safely went with the most right-wing newspaper as well. well Good choice. He, 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 he took the interest after that, so it was, um, it was the right... You would have said the Guardian would have filled you in anyway. It was, it was absolutely the... the Right call. But when I was down there to interview Creswell, it was a game against Blackpool, um, who brought quite a small travelling support. And what 
stood out straight away was the fact that they were given seats in the bottom tier of the away end. Yeah, which that, that's to, not happening, is it? No, to, to my knowledge, I don't think Leeds have ever had that, not in all the time I've been covering games down there. They always get wedged in, in the top tier. And I don't, I don't think this was by design, but as it turned out, the, the den is actually brilliantly um, designed, internally anyway, to keep the fans a million miles away from each other. It is a long long way away. I think it's very difficult to throw anything from the away end to the home end or vice versa. Um, so it tends to, to limit the, the actual trouble you get, but you do get quite a lot of unsavoury stuff around this. Um, but it is a game with edge. And I think when we got into the Premier League, even though Leeds were losing a lot of games and it wasn't always that much fun, the, there was just a bit more heat in it. You know, there's a bit more friction. I think the, the Leeds crowd certainly feel like they're more amongst their own with Premier League crowds and going to Premier League grounds. But this is the one that has a little bit of a little bit of niggle. Um and as I say, deep down I, I do like this game. Be interesting to see how the uh, the tragedy chanting stuff is addressed this year because we've seen you know the video from the two clubs that was put out on their socials. Yeah. I noticed I don't know did, did Leeds have the reply switched on because I know Millwall didn't. Well, it is probably for the best. And you've seen it with Liverpool and Man United as well because they, they have this issue with Hillsborough um, and Munich around around those games. And it, it kind of, it, it's a shame that it needs to be done, but it does need to be done. Um, how much difference it will make, we'll, we'll see at the weekend. But the, the thing I was going to say about the Blackpool game was it was actually a really sedate atmosphere for that. It was quite flat, it was quite low-key. Millwall won the game, were really pleased to win the game. But I found myself thinking... I've never been there without Leeds um, and it is a completely different, completely different spectacle. And you know that thing about play the game rather than the occasion? Over the years at the Den, Millwall have always been very good at, at playing both and playing them both really effectively. Um, Neil Harris seemed to have the the measure of that fixture. Kenny Jackett did as well. Kenny Jackett's like a really softly spoken, gentle guy to, to deal with. Um, but again, it seemed to know how to whip them up. Um, for that particular game and it worked more often than not um, and we spoke about Ipswich being a really good test for Farker and the squad I think this is the same but in a different way if that makes mm. sense I think you'll probably be able to read quite a lot into Leeds on the basis of how they play and, and how they cope down there I'd like to see Leeds from a footballing perspective handle this in the same way that England did um, going to, to Hamden this week and just you know, take all the uh, the booze or whatever it might be, and then just go out there and win. Just ignore all that, or you know, use it as a as a positive yeah. experience. Um, but yeah, I mean, like I, I'm with the tragedy chanting stuff. I honestly, I think it's I'm not impacted directly by it, so it's easy for me to say. But I think just just ignore it in the way. And I think Leeds fans handled it really, really well when they just sang "Boring, Boring Millwall" in the in the years gone by on this one because it just completely takes the wind out of it, doesn't it? Rather than reacting to it and singing something back or whatever. I will say if Millwall are now putting out things to try and discourage their fans from doing it, I hope they actually follow through with that in the ground as well because I've been at Millwall before and you you could see a bloke with a box of printed off turkey flags handing them out and you think, well, if a steward's that there... Was a, that was a particularly bad... If a steward is there doing one, yeah. the job, they would just go, well, obviously you're being thrown out these are being taken off people. Well, they don't do anything about it. But there was nothing done. Yeah. There was uh, Over at the other side, there were some people who had, um, it was, I mean, a bizarre thing to even think of doing, but an England flag with Sutcliffe 13 nil printed on it. And you, mm. you sort of saw it, and it was, it was almost so weird. It was like, well, that's, what What are you, what point are you actually making here? Yeah. Like, it, it was it was just very strange stuff the, some, of the, the, some of the times what went on there. There's not a, a huge amount of moral high ground in this because, you know, I've been to... Uh, Old Trafford when I've heard Munich chanting um, but also Old Trafford when I've heard Istanbul chanting it does go on you hear an absolutely unbelievable amount of Jimmy Savile chanting in in the EFL and I say it time and time again but it just seems incredible to me the way in which that is allowed to continue and persist without anybody saying a thing about it you know it just goes round and round and round um, and I think you're right there comes a point where you are best to ignore it but at the same time it does need to constantly be dealt with with sanctions, otherwise it does just just go on. I mean, the thing is that it's become it's become one of the the hot potatoes this year, or one of the hot you know the hot button topics, whatever it might be. The phrase I'm searching for. Uh, so they're they're clamping down on it this year. So it'll be interesting to see if there is something if something is sung, whether they do anything about it. Like I said, I'm, I'm not in any way trying to take the moral high ground, but no. are by no means you know the best behaved supporters in the land, contrary to the song. Um, you know, we've we've sung some pretty unsavoury stuff from our fans in the past. I'm just curious to see how it, how it plays out this time and to see whether anything does happen if it does get sung because, like I say, it's become one of those things they want to address this year. It's been ignored for many, many years. I do know, you know, that the um, 
the person handing out the flags, it was reported directly to Millwall, was that as well, by mm-hmm. some Leeds fans, and they did nothing about it. I think there's not there's not necessarily a willingness to sanction their own fan base. I, I, I don't know why, uh, you know, but that's their choice, isn't it? I wrote a column, I was at the Union Post at the time for that, I wrote a column after that the following week saying that what happened on that afternoon is is actually grounds for them having to play a game, a handful of games, whatever, behind closed doors for that. I don't, I can't remember what happened now, but it, whatever it was, if there was any sanction, it was something fairly small and kind of meaningless. I presume financial, but there may have been nothing. Um, it's, it's that long ago now. But that was the day where somebody seemed to have printed out Turkish flags, small paper flags, and have handed them round the crowd. And you've got to fight that in the way that you've got to fight an awful lot of of what goes on in football. I mean, I you remember the. Um, homophobic chance towards Conor Gallagher at Ellen Road right in the middle of the Rainbow Laces campaign I was really disappointed with the Premier League because we approached them for comment about that and all they would say is I'll refer you to the statement that we put out at the beginning about the importance of the campaign and we were saying no we get that you know I understand that but what about the you know specifically what's going on you know what happened last night in in the middle of it, and it's the same with you know Jimmy Ch- uh, Jimmy Savile chance in um, Istanbul, Munich and, and Hillsborough and everything else. Um, it does just feel though as if the game is actually starting to mobilise properly against it now, and, and perhaps it it will make a difference, and perhaps there won't be any of that on on Sunday. But one way or the other, it will be very spiky. I mean, the other side to this is like I like the fact that it's spiky. Of course, you know, I, yeah. gr- I grew up on yeah. fixtures that were that were tasty like that. The the tragedy stuff, it's like, I feel like I just want to say to people, grow up mm-hmm. a little bit, just leave it, just stop it. But it's just a thing that's going to take time, isn't it? Like, like all chance, when all chance, if you, if you tell football supporters not to do a thing, they'll generally go and do it because there's some sort of, I don't know, some sort of defiance mm-hmm. and a, a willingness to run against the grain, isn't there? Um, it, so it, you just got to appeal to people's better nature, I think, because, because I just, I just don't like it. I, mean, I, I personally, I think, What's it going to be like, you know, for the Loftus and Spate families when they're singing stuff like that? And it, you know, it cuts both ways as well, like, you know, you Yo, talk abs- about absolutely. Any, any tragedy. I, I did the Istanbul piece and it was really telling in that how, how badly affected people have been by it. But also um, did a piece with one of the Hillsborough families last year. And it's the same. I mean, it's done immense damage to them. And, and a lot of them are still really, really badly affected by it. Um, and I think you would find it you'd find it very hard to rationalise any of it. I think they do, you know, and they don't understand why why it goes on. Um, and, you know, it, it just it just is pretty ignorant and it and it, it does need to be addressed. So it's not a bad thing that, that they've done that this week. And and you would like to think that there won't be any of it on Sunday. We'll see. Um, we'll see how it goes. But I'm with you. I do like the fact that there is edge to this game because you do have a lot of games in the Championship where there isn't that much, if you know what I mean. There isn't. Kind yeah. of what you'd call. I know you say it's not rivalry, but there is it, it. It is that fixture that people do look for because you know that it will be higher up the scale of intensity than most of the games that that you play. And yeah. there's nothing wrong with that. And when you when you drop it's parallels just, with the Premier League as well, and how sterile and managed that whole thing is, you know, like I was saying in one of the shows, was it a couple of days ago? Like, I don't miss anything about the Premier League other than the fact we need to be there. You know, I and, I haven't I haven't missed it so far apart from the fact that you no longer see properly, properly elite players, you know. Um, there's a baseline standard in the championship, definitely, which is very, very even, very even. There are a lot of players and plenty of good footballers, really good footballers in the division, but there are a huge number who are on, seem to be on pretty much exactly the same level. Whereas in the Premier League, even in the seasons that were really tough, you, you could take a bit of, you know, pleasure from, detached pleasure from De Bruyne, Haaland, you know, Get Salah, guys like yeah, that. You, you can appreciate, the, appreciate yeah, good football, can't you? Yeah, appreciate yeah, good yeah. footballers as well. Um, it isn't quite the same in the Championship, but it's a bit more competitive, isn't it? Yeah, it's more... Not, uh, not even a bit. It's, well, it's potentially more fun, isn't it, in that mm. regard, in that anybody could beat anybody on the day. And I think, I, I guess I'm viewing it as well from uh, through the prism of thinking, well, we've actually got a good chance, we've got a good team in here, so there's there's a greater chance of us winning some games, yeah. which is probably why I'm... Um, more sympathetic towards it as an idea. If we were still gurgling around fifteenth every year, I'd be thinking, you know, let's oh, just fold the club. <laughs> I do wonder as well, um, with it being Sunday twelve o'clock, will that take this thing out of it a little bit? Because I did see the, um, I think it was the Scarborough Whites tweeting out that their pickup um, for their bus is four a.m. <laughs> no. <like>, what? <laughs> Good yeah. God. Well, Phil's, Phil's going down the night before, so we can really get stuck into the booze early. That, that's yeah. it. That's it. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, people will say that I would, was at my most hungover um, at a particular game at Millwall going back about 15 years ago, but I'm very much a reformed character these days, so it'll be early, early bed for me on Saturday. But no, I'm going down Saturday because it is such a such an early kickoff. off um, It probably will, yeah, yeah, it probably will. Yeah, I do wonder. Um, how would you expect Leeds to line up in this one and, and what's your one to watch as well? What's the, the aspect of the game that... Um you think we should keep an eye on or any player or well one one to watch at the moment I think is Archie Gray because he was supposed to go away with England under 19s um, in this international break um, the club said after the Sheffield Wednesday game that he wouldn't be going um, I think because of a minor fitness issue but I suspect that bigger picture being just very very keen to manage his workload to manage his, his training load and his playing load because he is very young and this is his first season of, of senior football Um I don't think anything that went on in the first month of the season would be encouraging Farker to take him out of the team. Um, but they clearly are already thinking about his body and his, his management and, and everything else. And they do have... Um, Gruev, we've seen um, Farker in a few years' time. I would assume that Gruev is, is now um, available to play. Uh, they've got Kamara as well. They actually, for the first time in years, have options in the centre of midfield. So it doesn't all need to be on Gray. It doesn't all need to be on Ampadu. I would say that against Sheffield Wednesday, and I wonder if this is part of the reason why he didn't go away with England, Gray probably looked a little bit jaded towards the end of that. I thought Ampadu was the better of the two the two centre mids. <laughs> but he's been terrific, and you can see that the massive talent there. Um, uh, he won't want to come out of the team, but I think, and I might ask Farke about this today, how do you manage him given that you can't, you wouldn't be sensible to flog him for 46 games? Um, definitely not. And the fact that you've got central midfielders means that you don't need to and that you shouldn't um, so while I think Gray will stay in the team on Sunday it'd be a surprise if, if he was out of it at what point does the, the rotation start? I guess as well it's probably a new experience for him as well the atmosphere and everything whereas someone like Glenn Kamara you would say well has played in old firm games will have will have had quite a high level of hostility in, yeah. in the past Well I remember um, A.D. White having a bit a young A.D. White having a bit of a nightmare down at the den um, he'd been doing really well otherwise. Um, and it is that sort of atmosphere that, that gets on top of you a little bit. You were right about the Scotland-England game. I was listening to so much of what was being said beforehand about best Scotland team in ages, Hamden will be really, really hostile, this, that and the other, you know, how are England going to cope? And I was thinking, this is how it turned out. I thought, you know, like Harry Kane's played in the Premier League for a decade. You know, he's been to Arsenal and he's been to Anfield and, and everywhere else. Bellingham's at Real Madrid, I mean, El Clasico coming up, which is, you know, I, I would suspect on a different level to the Hamden crowd without having ever been to um, El Clasico. Players all the way through that, you know, you're not telling me Foden goes to Hamden and thinks, oh, you know, a bit scared of this, Kyle Walker and others. It's just um, it's just standard fare for them. They, they, oper- they operate at a level that's yeah, they, beyond they just, that. Isn't and it? and yeah. they are different class to that Scotland team. Whatever's been said about Scotland at the moment, that England team has talent way beyond what's available to, to Steve Clark. And I think, I do think pound for pound, looking at Millwall's lineup and Leeds lineup, that the, the greater supply of talent is available to Farker. Um, but we've seen so many times over the years at Millwall that the atmosphere does make a difference, particularly if, if Millwall manage to find a way to play the occasion. You seem to be veering a bit, Michael, towards Glenn Kamara. I, I feel like I am a little bit just to, uh, I don't like that experienced head in there. I mean, we don't it, know how... It, assuming he's up to it tactically. I was going to say, we don't entirely know how fit Gray is, do we? Is, is the assumption that he is absolutely fine? Um, there was a suspicion that he might be basically absolutely fine. Um, although I don't think in any way you could say that it would be a bad decision to say to him, look, in these two weeks, it probably wouldn't be a good idea to be away train, you know, recuperate a little bit. We'll we'll find out, find out properly today. That would... That would have to be the call, wouldn't it, between Kamara? Like, I mean, I suppose Farke was a big fan of Gruev, really, really wanted to bring Gruev in. So he does have a decision now to make about how, you know, who who has the favour predominantly in this group of four. It seems to me that you could see Ampadu play from start to finish. I mean, he, he's looked really good. I think you were saying, Dan, that he seems to fall into that category of player who <laughs> hasn't proved himself in the Premier League yet but looks comfortably good enough, if not better than championship level Ampadu. I think it really, really good signing. Um, and with Gray, yeah, I mean, 
happy times into keeping the team because he's been playing so well. But I know what you mean about Kamara. Kamara has played it in much higher level games, you know, notably the Europa League final, but, you know, a lot of old firm derbies as well. So he, he knows his way around this sort of fixture. Uh, and it could be Gruev rather than Kamara could if somebody be. does yeah. come in. Yeah, I'm almost writing him off already yeah. just because yeah. I know more I, about Kamara than I, I think, do. I think it's probably just because he, he wasn't involved for the, the Sheffield Wednesday game. Um, I haven't got the impression so far that Farker is massive on mixing it up if he doesn't need to you know he doesn't seem like a, a rotation man for rotation's sake I think if Sinistera hadn't left before the Wednesday game it would have been you know very similar to the the lineup that was used down at Ipswich but he does have options and I think in the centre of midfield how many years have we moaned about the, the lack of options there um, I think Championship Club to have the choice of you know in, in those two those two positions Ampadu Gray Kamara and Gruev is as much as you could look for Talk to me about fullbacks then Yes. What do you reckon? So, left back, do you put Jamie Shack in because he's known to the Millwall crowd? Maybe takes a little bit of the sting out of it there? Well, I think if um, Byram and Fulpo aren't available, and we'll find out shortly, um, but Farker was saying they should be fit on the other side of the international break, but whether or not that means fit to train or fit to be involved, we'll see. Highly, highly unlikely that it would be Fulpo because he hasn't played for it, eight, you know, as trained for ages he's been um, he's been missing since the middle of pre-season um, a little bit different with Byram um, if neither of them are available I don't see an alternative to Shackleton and Shackleton was easily good enough against Sheffield Wednesday to, to justify going in there I think because has his form not been good enough to, to leave him in regardless yeah, of how yeah, fit well you, you may be right I mean I wrote about him earlier this week and I was saying you know it's it's been a bit of a rebirth for him which it had to be if he was going to get a last look in at Leeds because his contract's up next summer and at the start of the window, you know, he was looking for a, or expecting to look for a, a move away either on loan or, or permanently. It looked like it was it was done. But Shackleton did what he always does in pre-season, which is he's front of the pack when they're running, stats are better than anybody else's, wins the bleep tests or dominates the bleep tests largely. Um, coaches automatically look at him and say... He's, you know, there's something there. There's something to to work with. He, he appeals because his attitude's always really, really good. And I spoke to Neil Redfern for that that the piece that we wrote, because the thing about Shackleton was when he was like 15, 16, he was one of the ones that always got referenced in the academy. People would always say to you, "Lot to look out for this kid. He's he's going to be really good." And Redfern made the point, which I thought was was right on the money, which was that you know last month you had Farker looking around at people who were agitating to go, you know, threatening legal action to to get their way out. Um, Nonto refusing to play on strike however you want to put it but that's that's how it was and then you've got somebody in Shackleton whose stats great effort's great attitude is great wants to play and it must you know he must have fallen into the category of player that Farker thought that's just exactly what I need right now question is three months time is he still getting a game mm. yeah still a very useful squad player though At 100% yeah I think I think Farker looks at him like that as well that his versatility is a bonus because you can move him around. It just becomes difficult, doesn't it? Because I think we can safely assume that unless injuries bite in a big way, he's not going to play in the centre of midfield mm-hmm. um, because of the, the other options there. You've got Ailing and Spence at right back and I can't help feeling that if Spence gets on a roll, you know, that will that position will be locked down. Left side of defence, not so clear, I don't think. Um, and the, the worry with Byron getting injured, you know, almost immediately is that he has had fairly major injury problems. So does that become a kind of a constant issue as the season goes on. So perhaps there's a, a, a place for, for Shackleton to play there. I still wonder whether this time next year Shackleton will be playing elsewhere. You know, if he'll be a, he'll be out of contract, he'll he'll be moving on. But it wouldn't surprise me at all if Fark says to the club we ought to speak to him about his contract. I mean perversely, it's the it's the classic thing that um if we were to get promoted, you could almost imagine him moving more than if we didn't. Yeah. You know, if we if we were to stay down, keep him round for a year, you know yeah. he knows the club. He does know, know the club. We know how important yes, that is. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. We're um, big advocates of that. Awesome. Yeah, he's, he, but he is a known quantity. There is some sense in that, I dare say. Um, but if we were to go up, then you would argue that if you were being completely merciless, you move him on, don't you, I suppose? The, the way the club's run since Farker was appointed um, has pretty much been, it's operated and changed the squad and everything else has been done on Farker's say so, you know, he seems to me to be totally in charge. And I don't mean he's not working with other people, but there are no signings being made without his approval. You know, it was his decision to shift Sinistera and Nonto out of the, the dressing room. There's a, a really, really strong level of authority there. So given that 
you know, this is being touted as a, a much broader plan with Farker managing the club in the Premier League somewhere down the line. That's certainly how he sees it and how the club would like to see it. Um, if Farker says to them, you need to speak to Shackleton about a contract extension, then they will. You know, mm-hmm. they, they will, will do that. And it wouldn't be a surprise if he does because it probably isn't anybody over the course of the games last month who played much better than him. If only we knew who his agent was. <laughs> we, should, we should get Hayden yeah. in, actually, because yeah. um, it's always um, good entertainment. Well, I think, I think Hayden's point of view on this would be that if if he's not playing and if he can't, if, if this season develops as seasons have for Shackleton, and I know he's had injuries as well, but look at his stats at Leeds. Small number of starts, 20-odd, large number of substitute appearances in comparison, 50-odd. Um, that's how it's been for him. He hasn't quite managed to, to find his niche. And I think if it's another season where you where people are saying to you, we really value you, and this is all genuine, this, you know, it was the same with Bielsa, you know, really value you, like what you do, um, but you're not playing games and you turn turning 24 in October. You've got to start thinking about yourself and your career as opposed to your, your attachment to Leeds and how much you, you want to stay here. I think they'd be pretty sensible about and it. And this is the grown-up um, parent in me saying it, but we saw the uh, the baby gender reveal um, video, didn't we, in the last week as well. And I suppose there's a there's an argument for saying he's going to want to start putting down roots. If you're having a kid, you don't want to be you know moving out on loan everywhere, do you, like every year or whatever. You want to be looking for somewhere to settle down so you can start bringing up a family. And also, if you're out of contract next summer, your options are broader. You know, you, you have more clubs who are able to, to take you on. If you've had a Good season, relatively good season, even if Leeds aren't sure, there'll be other 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 sides who are. So I have no doubt at all that Shackleton will sort, of, sort himself out. Just going to be quite intriguing with him as to whether or not there is a, actually a long-term picture for him here or whether it will be another club that he goes to. Uh, right back then, we touched on it a bit there with uh, with Jed Spence. Does Jed Spence come into this one? Because Ailing, I think, to be fair to him, has just been struggling a bit this season, hasn't he? We've written about Spence this morning. Um who is that classic enigma of speak to 100 people about him and some will tell you that he's hard work and he's a handful, Neil Warnock in particular, um, did not want him at, at Middlesbrough. Um, other people will tell you that he was phenomenal. Oh, coming, coming from at, such a likeable character. That's... Other people tell you that he's phenomenal at Nottingham Forest, at, like, absolutely brilliant for them. And that Steve Cooper at Forest seems, seems to be, to this point, the one coach who's really got Spence and has really worked out how to get the, the best out of him. Forrest played with a back three or a back five, however you want to call it, but it meant that Spence could play as a wing back on the right-hand side. And that seems to be, the feeling seems to be that that's what suits him best. And obviously Leeds don't do that. Leeds have got a back four, but a back four in which Farker does like the fullbacks to, to bomb on. Um, I liked Spence when he came off the bench against Sheffield Wednesday just a couple of little flashes in, in what was left of the game which wasn't a huge amount we said at the time and I'd say it again I just don't see Spence as an impact player you know I just think no. he is somebody who you want in your, your starting lineup, and um, I don't imagine he's come to be a substitute either I feel like I feel like there will be a change in the guard there yeah just looking at the, the thrust of your article on The Athletic it's like can you find a home at Leeds? And it's almost like that's what he needs. He's, he got his move to Spurs and it's just not worked out for him at Spurs. With Greta Steinson, as, as we know, was quite um, instrumental in getting that move for him. Yeah, and also Steinson liked him at, um, at Everton as well, you know, um, and, and I'd had a, had a look at him. Um, and and it's, I think everybody agrees that he's a massively talented footballer. Um, they're quite interesting because the feeling at Middlesbrough was that they were, they were surprised when he went to Forest and did so well. They, they were getting rid of him because... Um, there were issues with his attitude, certainly from Warnock's point of view. They just were banging heads. It was a case of, I can't work with this guy, he's, he's got to go. So they loaned him out to Forrest, where he was excellent. Forrest got promoted, went on that really long run um, under Steve Cooper. And obviously that becomes uh, a bone of contention because you have a crowd at Middlesbrough who are sitting saying, why Why is this guy in the, the lineup of a promotion rival and um, getting them up via the, the playoff final? Um, but I don't think... Butter expected him to go there and, and play that well and then to come back with Tottenham all over him. Um, I mean, Tottenham were always doing that deal. But then the problem for him at Tottenham was that he he joined and straight away Antonio Conte basically said, that's a club signing this, you know, club wanted him. Um, it wasn't disparaging like that, but people read between the lines and it was as if, and you know what Conte is like, very, very forthright and single-minded. It was as if, you know, I didn't go looking for this player. They brought him in. Perhaps he'll be good, whatever. But, you know. It's what with Jack Clark as well, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Pochettino seemed totally, totally indifferent about Jack Clark. Um, and 
you know, so it's not the first time that that's happened. But it doesn't set the scene very well, does it? And I think to this point, Spence has played like seven minutes for, for Spurs, so so hasn't been able to kick on. So he needs a good year. Leeds need a good year. Spurs need him to, to have a good year as well. Because I think the door is still slightly, slightly open there. Um, but fact is, was the best right back in the division with Forrest, and that is very, very recently. So you feel like you've got to be making good use of him. You know the answer to this, Phil, so don't answer it. But Michael, um, so he came through Fulham's academy as a right back, and um, then he moved out. But who was the young right back coming in behind him in Fulham's academy? Cody Drama. Correct. Ah, yeah, boom. Yeah. Um, well, funnily enough, he played more at centre back um, down at Fulham. He was really good at bringing bringing the ball out. But they, the 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 feeling was that his. Um, his aerial power wasn't quite what it needed to be. So little by little, he moved out um, to a wider role and he's got pace and he's got legs and he's got really good stamina. He's got a lot of skill. Um, he's a good, good all-round player. I, th- I thought that was one of the, I thought that was among the best signings Leeds made in the window. Yeah, let's definitely, let's hope it pays off. Um, up front, we saw some issues, maybe wrinkles that needed to be ironed out yeah. between Piro, who was dropping deep and Jorginho Ruta, who was playing in a more advanced position. It just... Um, not got everyone's backs up, but people could see it wasn't working against Sheffield Wednesday for whatever reason, the the, the pack defence. Will we see a different approach from Millwall, do you think, at the den on Sunday, which perhaps gives them a bit more space to operate in? Do they stick with the same plan? Do they maybe look to tweak it and Piro goes further forward? Yeah, Millwall tend to play with three at the back. Um, did last season as well, which is why Shackleton found himself from time to time playing on, on the right-hand side. Um, I, it, it, he very much gave the impression, Farker, that he's quite happy with the setup of Ruta at nine, Pirro at ten. I think most of us probably feel like you'd rather see Pirro at nine and I can't help feeling that a bit more physicality up there um, would would help. What Farker was wanting against Wednesday and what happened on a couple of occasions but not enough was for Ruta's pace to take him in behind Wednesday and to, to crack the low block um, by you know by beating the offside flag um, and opening things up. Um I suspect that Millwall at the den will be more aggressive in the play, more attacking in the play um, than Sheffield Wednesday were. So perhaps it develops into a bit more of an Ipswich game um, mm. than than what we saw. I think, I mean, we, we went over this, but I think what happening at Sheffield Wednesday is going to happen time and time again at Ellen Road. I think there'll be a lot of teams who come in and take that same approach. So you wonder, don't you, if, uh, or maybe hopefully from our point of view, and I am the eternal optimist, but maybe Millwall starts to play the occasion rather than the game as well, and it gives us that little bit of space to operate in, like Ipswich, because Ipswich yeah. left us space to play in, and we absolutely punished them for it. So that's my that's my hope going into this one anyway. He does have options. You know, he could play Somerville um, in behind Piro, and I think sees Somerville as, as far more of a 10 than a, a winger. Um, he could, I suppose, drop Ruta into the, the 10 area again uh, still to be proved whether or not that's really where he's going to thrive that as we as we discussed about the squad you know left back and 10 are probably the two positions where it's not quite perfect or the, the depth of choice isn't necessarily exactly what you'd want um, But and, and I think whereas at left back you've got Byron who looks like he'd be really competent if he plays there Shackleton who looks like he could be good there as well I think at 10 you really do need somebody who is clicking properly because it's such a key position when it comes to creating creating chances and goals. Um, just to circle back to where we started actually on this show, which was to, to talk about like the tragedy chanting and stuff like that. I'm aware that we've got Hull away midweek as well. And you wonder, will there be some rotation um, maybe in the team for that game on Wednesday? Do they, they mix it up for that? Or maybe give Archie Gray a rest on Saturday and then bring him back in for the whole game perhaps? Yeah, um, the, 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 there are always come points in the season where you have to do that. And Farka will be big on you know physical management and everything else. Again, it'd be a good question for him today that about how no, it, it's... Different, isn't it? Back to back league and, and league cup. Um, although because of the way things were with, with his resources, he, he was he found himself almost forced to use Ampadu and Gray more than perhaps he would have liked in the the league cup games. Um, he said it was good for them. You know, it was good to to get some rhythm and and keep them ticking over. But I think uh, you know the fact that Gray hasn't gone away with England shows that he's played probably more last month than, than would have been ideal. Um, so yeah, you you would think that this is where you have to start managing things fairly carefully. And you can't pretend it's a massive squad that leads. It, it isn't. It's not tiny either. Um, but the injuries will, injuries, fitness will, will play a pretty big part, I think. Yeah, with regards to the, the tragedy chanting, um, I think we're expecting to hear something from um, Leeds and Hull in the run-up to the game, much like we have you know, with, um, with Millwall. Just addressing the fact that because um, we've obviously 
seen Turkish flags, as we mentioned at the, at the start of the show, and they've got um, Turkish owners, haven't they, at, at Hull? Um, yeah. And a lot of Turkish flags around the stadium. So I think they're expecting to address that probably at the start of next week or thereabouts. That, um, that's one of those situations that's kind of unfortunate, really, and, and everybody has to be grown up about and sensible about, I think, some of what's gone on in previous games, you know, like Millwall games and um, and so on, is completely different and you know should totally be addressed in the way that it has been. But yeah, I understand why they would do that. Yeah, and the return fixture is going to be at the start of April as well, Leeds against Hull. So I think they're looking to perhaps address that in the run-up to that. Um, so, you know, would it be the right thing to do from a sensitivity point of view to start bringing Turkish flags into Ellen Road? How's that going to go down? Obviously one for further down the line, but I know that they're probably looking to head this one off at the pass because that's the, that's the Easter Monday game, isn't it, the whole game? It is tricky. It's tricky. I mean, you see, you know, with like with Rafinha, um, people uh, would take the leads away and Brazilian flags for him. Um, I think if... The reasoning behind it is benign. Then it's it you know it's very hard to argue with somebody doing that. But um, at the same time, it's just a really really sensitive topic and quite difficult to handle. But I think that's that's where you have to give it a bit more thought. And, and as I say, people have to be a bit more grown up about it. But I think with regards to actual deliberate tragedy chanting, um, you can you can hit that with a sledgehammer. Um, I meant to ask as well because I wrote down the name Stuart Dallas when we were talking about central midfield. Mm. Any signs of, of Dallas being back? Because he, he addressed somebody on Twitter um, this week who were saying they'd heard rumours of, of Dallas being forced to retire due to the severity of his injuries. And, and Stuart Dallas just popped up and said, fake news, and then went away yeah, again. So he, he's working, he's been working incredibly hard um, to, to unbelievable get himself hard? Back. Unbelievable hard, I would imagine. Um, because it's been 18 months now, and that's almost unheard of, really, for, for footballers. I, if I think back, I was blethering on about, you know, hearts back in the, the 1980s. I remember Craig Levine getting a really, really bad knee injury. And it was, I, I don't know how long he was out for, but it felt to me like he was out forever. You know, it was like years and years, and it probably wasn't. But you, you have it in your head that you go back 20, 30 years, if you suffered a bad knee injury, I mean, Gaza. injury, yeah, yeah Gaza that was it, out, it could be... It could be 18 months, whereas these days there seems to be, and it's medical advances, but there seems to be no injury apart from career-ending ones. I mean, back then they were just applying you with brandy, saw yeah, it off. Yeah, that's, you know. that's pretty much it, yeah. yeah. Seal it up with oil and then burning <laughs> oil and then just throw you back out again. There's very very little these days that seems to keep players out for this length of time, so it's obviously been tough for Dallas, as it was always going to be, because it's a really nasty injury, the um, broken, fractured femur, um, and very rare one as well, but it's such a critical part of your body when it comes to, to running you know it needs to be able to take really strong um, bearing load and and I guess as well you'd need to be very careful that you don't do it again surely only so many times you can damage that particular bone before it gives you problems outside of sport um, so no I, I it was I, I noticed the tweet him him replying to that I think he's very much got it in his head that he still wants to get himself back and has been absolutely from what I'm told anyway has been you know cracking the whip behind mm. himself to, to try and get to to that point it'd be, be nice to, to see him back I think what it will be very difficult to predict um, until he starts playing again is, is what he's going to look like and physically how he's going to be because it's not as if football is, football is getting any less intense or any slower While we're on the long term injuries Bamford He's another one to ask about today because I thought before um, and the the press conference after um, the Wednesday game was cut short because Sheffield Wednesday's manager um, was needing to come in and answer questions, although he then sat there and spoke for about fifty <laughs> minutes. So can we just get can we get Farker back in so we can ask you about Bamford? Because I I wanted to to put that question to him because it it seemed as if in that he in one of his comments he almost said Bamford is getting close, you know, implying that it might be back on this side of the again the side of the international break, not not too long. So ask about him. It would I know. I know what the narrative around Bamford has been for so long, but I do think again you get him back in the squad with Pirro there as well, and it's a it's a bonus. Yeah, Pirro takes the pressure off Bamford, it does, doesn't it? And yeah. it's, what we, it's what we were crying out for yeah. for ages. Just say, exactly that, yeah. just give us some something else to focus our attention on as fans, and allow Patrick Bamford the time to either get fit or just ease him back into games, rather than chucking him in. Then he scores one goal, injures himself in the process, and he's back out again. And people get frustrated with it. Re- just... Remove the conversation of if Bamford isn't scoring, who the hell is getting the goals uh, at nine? And that you know that was the problem for. Well, obviously Rodrigo did start to score last last season, um, but yeah, I think it, it does make a difference. And suddenly you start to think if you've got the choice of Pirro and Bamford, who does score goals in this league, um, it's not not a bad choice. 
and the highest rated player in the new FIFA EA24, Patrick Bamford with 75 alongside a couple well, of others. I'll tee you award for it. You're not playing that? No, no. <laughs> no time for that. Billy football case. <laughs> <laughs> right then, we'll wrap it up there. Then, um, dare, we, um, dare we predict what's going to happen on, on Sunday? No. Uh, you know, the eternal optimist in me says, do you know what, well, this, this is the time we get down there and our quality will shine through. Michael will say the opposite. Well, uh, yeah, probably. I, I suppose I've looked through the Millwall squad and management and I feel like there's normally been a proper bastard hanging around this fixture <laughs> there's normally been like a Steve Morrison or a, a Neil Harris or someone who you can a pantomime villain yeah I do look through the Millwall team now and I'm like mm, I don't know he's I kind of recognise some of the names but it's a bit like all the championship teams and that's just probably you know we become Premier League dickheads don't we we spend three years in the Premier League and you expect to have all these players who you see see in FIFA or on your telly every week turning up and then suddenly you're back in the championship because you're absolutely abysmal and um, you're up against these grizzled championship bastards every week I mean they've got they seem to have a Wallace in the squad they've always had a Wallace in the squad (laughs) I'm sure I'm sure I hate him but I can't is it William Wallace that guy probably yeah Yeah, he's been been there a long time I'm pretty sure that um the the den the design of the den was based on Ibrox or at least very similar to Ibrox because um, there does seem to be some Rangers link down there I'm not quite sure what it is so maybe it is yeah maybe that's it they've got to have a Wallace is it every the uni- season is it the Union Jacks mm, yeah yeah possibly <laughs> they do also have <laughs> <laughs> they do still seem to have EastEnders character Billy Mitchell in the the squad as well right excellent good to see yeah um, so yeah. now, now no, we... I don't, I'd rather not predict anything about this I mean even even with Bielsa it was a last minute equaliser from Harrison wasn't it? Um, it was a defeat when Berardi got sent off. It just There's just something about Millwall. But you can't lose at a ground all the time. And I have seen McCormack score a winner there. I have seen Prutton and Andy Hughes, Andrew Hughes, win a game there. Um, there, mu- there must be something else in it. There must- Not that run. There's just Phil, nothing Phil Hay, out with, now, with the same yeah. cowardly approach to his predictions as he took when he went undercover yeah. in, at Millwall and pretended he was uh, from the Daily that's, Mail. That's it. That's it. Um, I'm going for... Uh, Feisty game that could go either way. Thank you very much. Right, well, we'll get back together on Monday, see how it went then, shall we? Why not? See you in a bit. The Square Ball Podcast.